So, hello everyone. Hope you're uh, hearing me well. Uh, welcome to DevConf. My name is Lenka. Uh, I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Valentin, uh, will be talking about uh, auto updating containers, Podman on the edge. Uh, there will be uh, some time for your questions after the session. Uh, you can write them into the Q&A section. So without any further delay, uh, Valentin, you can start. Thank you, Linka. Uh, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure here at DEF CONF. Uh, really great organization. All, always cool. Even virtual, which is always a little bit odd, I find. It's still a great pleasure. Um, Preeti sends her regards. She's out of office today, so you have to deal with me. I'm Valentin. I work in the Container Runtimes team at Red Hat. And before clicking on the next slide, I want to have a common definition of what the edge is. There's various uh, definitions out, at least that I've heard so far. And my favorite one is really computing outside the data center. This could be, you know, a light bulb, an oil rig offshore, or a car. And managing such workloads is of increasing importance at the moment. And this presentation covers how Portman can be used on the edge today and the things we've built together in the past around two years with the community. So to the agenda. First, we start with Portman and System D. Um, I guess a couple of you have already heard me talk and write about that. Um, you know, how we can run system D inside Portman, how we can run Portman inside system D services. This really is the, the base uh, requirement for what we are about to do on the edge at the moment. Then I also want to elaborate a little bit on Portman's architecture. Um, this is important to understand why Portman, in contrast to some other container engines, integrates pretty, pretty well in system D in a modern Linux desktop. More about that later. And then finally, we can talk about auto updates. You know, how do auto updates look like from a bird's eye perspective, conceptually, how we implemented it with Potman. And then last but not least, since Potman 3.4, we also support simple rollbacks, which means if an update fails, we revert back to the known working state. So I'll skip the usual introduction slides to Potman. I think the DevConf community have heard or has heard until now plenty of talks. If you don't know Potman yet, it's a drop-in replacement for Docker. And we added quite a lot of new features to it. And later on, I'll explain a little bit the difference um, with regards to the architecture. But when it comes to Portman System D, the team and I think Red Hat in general really tries to come up or follow the containers are Linux philosophy. Containers in the end are just ordinary processes on our Linux system with some attributes that are different than if I would run, you know, a common or an ordinary binary on the host root of S. We really want to focus on a seamless integration into modern Linux systems and well, arguably system D is an integral part actually, actually at the center, the heart of a modern Linux system. So supporting system D in conjunction, in conjunction with containers um, was really important for us. Um, historically, it has been difficult because it was hard to integrate into you know, client server architectures. I'm gonna talk later a little bit about that. And Docker upstream really didn't target, for instance, supporting system D. So we were facing a couple of challenges because users were asking for it, customers were asking for it. Um, we wanted to run it. And um, at some point, you know, when Portman was born, um, we could just made it a first class citizen in Portman and just support it by default. When it comes to containers in general in system D, there are two scenarios that um, we should discuss. Um, the first one is really running system D inside a container. Why do we want to run system D in a, inside a container? Well, I think the most important argument for doing that is portability. Again, containers are Linux and there shouldn't really be a difference if I install a package or run, let's say, HTTPD inside a container in contrast to running on the host. Historically, as I said, this has been difficult because it hasn't been supported for a long while at Docker. 
So users had to come up with custom scripts. Um, they were pretty much forced to write, you know, their manual startup scripts, which was not the best user experience. Um, it was also, you know, pretty pretty hard for software vendors um, such as Red Hat to support it. How how is a company supposed to, you know, support custom scripts? Um, so running inside a container really gives a huge portability advantage. The second scenario that we're going to elaborate later on as well is running a container or potman inside a system D service. So containerizing system D services. Again, containers are Linux and there shouldn't really be a difference. And I always find it pretty, pretty cool because it's, um, yeah, like a marriage of rather traditional Linux sysadmin work where, you know, we're using system D, we're writing our service scripts, our dependencies are managed, everything uh, is, you know, explorable. Um, we can just use the tools that we're using for a long while already, but also in conjunction with the cloud native world and make uh, use and benefit from everything that has happened with containers in, in the past almost 10 years. So to give a brief example of system D inside a container or inside Podman, it's really no rocket science. Simply, you know, system D simply needs a specific environment to be set up, which mostly boils down to a couple of mounts, such as varlib shornal D to be mounted as a tempfs. And then we can start system D in the container. So Podman does that automatically when the container's entry point is either an init or directly system D, you know, Podman looks at the entry point of the image or what the user has specified on the command line or via the REST API. And then it does all the, the mounting dance automatically for us. But it can be further tweaked by using the dash dash system D command line flag. And here, what we can see in the example in the terminal is, you know, we run a UBI8 dash init container, which is a UBI8 image with system D pre-installed, which is pretty, pretty cool. And if we run Potman top on this container and we list the process IDs, the users, and the commands, we can see that, well, oh, pretty cool. System D is PID 1. It's the init process, which is exactly what system D is supposed to do. And then there's also the journal and the DBus daemon running. Now to the second use case, when it comes to running containerized system D services, this is a bit more rocket science. Um, there are many things to consider, you know, to properly integrate a container engine such as Podman into system D. There are many moving targets. There's not only Podman running, but there's gonna elaborate on it in a, in a moment. A couple of other tools, even more when we run um, Podman as an ordinary rootless user. But Potman makes it or simplifies this, this adventure with Potman generate system D command. So the input for Potman sorry, Potman generate system D are either containers or pods, and the output is well, system D units that we can then install on the host, either run as the system service, as root, or as a user service. Um, which will then be a rootless container. It's we really improve it continuously with best practices from upstream. You know, we work a lot together with the community. Um, it has been well received, which is super cool. And for sure, also downstream Red Hat. Um, things that we notice on customer sides, feedback we get from customers, um, conversations we're having with other teams. And one example for conversations we have with other teams is the future work is you know, really great addition taking it to the next step is a more declarative approach via dot container files and system D generators. And there's a cool project. So shout out to Alex Larson for coming up with Quadlet. If you're interested, check it out. It's um, similar to uh, a Docker Compose file or Kubernetes YAML. You know, you have an easy declarative way config file where you can say, okay, which image do I want to run with which containers? Uh, or which commands, and then Quadlet takes care of system defining everything. It um, is a really, really cool thing. If you want to learn about the details or really dig deeper into how Potman and system D work together in this scenario, um, feel free to refer to this blog. The team blogs a lot. 
we really write a lot about what we're doing. So if you're interested, just click on the link. I will upload the slides after this presentation. Now to Potman's architecture. It's really the enabler to run containerized systemd services. It hasn't been really possible with Docker before because systemd really wants and needs to know which processes are running in a service. And well, with a client server architecture, it's pretty hard. Um, and it really wants to pick and know a main process in order to manage the life cycle. If the main process exits, service isn't running anymore. So here really a quick comparison about the architecture. When we look at Docker, you know, we have the Docker client, which usually traditionally runs uh, as, a, as a rootless user, but it is part of the Docker group, which gives us access you know, read and write rights to the Docker socket, which in turn runs as root. So when we do a Docker run, it really sends a remote procedure call to the Docker daemon, which in turn talks to another daemon, which then finally does a fork exec to the container runtime, which is run C or C run, which then last but not least, finally, eventually runs the container. So when we have a system D service or system D unit file, which has an exec start, Docker run, yada, yada. Well, it's pretty hard for us and system D to know what is the container because we really want the container or, you know, a managing instance of the container to be the main process. So the, the team a couple of years ago has tried to, uh, for, for Docker to make it to make it work, and it worked to a certain degree, um, but the pull requests have been have been rejected. As I said, it was not really the, the a target of the Docker community to support this use case. For Portman, it's a little bit simpler um, the architecture, or quite simpler. Uh, we have Portman, then we have Conmon, which is short for Container Monitor. So. It's a, a very, 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 very small tool written in C with a incredibly low memory footprint, which in the end, you know, keeps certain resources open, such as uh, certain namespaces, file descriptors, and it exacts the runtime. And also it has a callback to Potman since it's not running as a daemon for things like cleaning up. So once a container exits, Conmon will figure that out because it's, it's running for the lifetime of the container. Once the container exits, depending on um, how the container has been started by the user, for instance, with a dash dash remove flag, Portman will then have a cleanup callback um, initiated by, by Conmon. So Conmon in this case, in a system D unit or in a running service is the main PID. As I said, it monitors and runs for the lifetime of the container. So system D then really knows, okay, the service is up and running, um, Conmon also exits with the exit code of the container. So things like restart policies um, just work. So I think most of you know this young gentleman, Dan Walsh. Um, he has excellent talks out there in the wild about the security benefits of Potman's architecture. I don't wanna um, leave it unmentioned. The architecture of Potman really has huge advantages when it comes and benefits when it comes to um, security, container security, but going into the details is really beyond the scope of this presentation. So I really recommend just watching Dan's talks. They're instructive, they're entertaining, and there's lots of things to learn. So slowly we're going over to, to auto updates, but before going into the details, I want to have a, you know, a, a bird's eye view on what auto updates really means in the context of a container. So let's take this example. We have a workload, could be anything, a light bulb, an oil rig, um, a ship on the ocean, a car, a train, whatever. It could be a fleet. We have a container registry and a sysadmin. On this workload, we have containers running using images from the container registry. So once the sysadmin pushes a new image to a registry, we really would like the workload, which is running somewhere on the edge, it could be really be offshore, to pull down the image automatically. And once there's a new image, they should pull it down and then restart the services um, with a new image. So it's as simple as that. In practice, well, we have a Potman auto update command since version 
3.1 or 3.2. Um, and it does exactly that. Um, it checks the container, Im the, the used images, checks at the registry, is there a new image, pulls them down, um, restarts the container or the services that are using this image. However, co um, the containers, so Potman must run in a system B service in order for, for this to work. Um, a blog post I reference uh, later in the presentation goes into the details. So let's Let's just uh, stick with that. These system or these services must run in a system D service. It can be triggered, well, manually by running the Portman auto update command or remotely via a REST API call to the Portman service. But there's also pre-installed, you know, on RHEL, Fedora, CentOS, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Arch, all Linux distributions that ship with Portman. Uh, Portman auto update service, so system D service. So can be integrated into, well, system D workflows. You can do a system uh, CTL start. It can be uh, integrated into some dependencies of whatever we are running um, locally. But there are also time-based triggers, which can be fired with the Potman auto update timer. So it really integrates well into Edge and, and IoT because the sysadmin really doesn't have to manage the fleet anymore. The fleet manages itself. The only thing that we need to do as sysadmins is to push new images, update them, and then the fleet takes care of the rest. Um, so why does it really make sense? Um, well, they're hard to reach. Devices on the Edge I mentioned it before, offshore, sometimes the uh, connection aren't uh, stable at all. If there is a boat somewhere on the ocean, there's probably no connection or at least not a stable one. Updates can also be scheduled and keeping the edge services secure and safe as possible from hackers is, well, increasingly important. And as I mentioned, since Portman 3.4, Portman ships with simple rollbacks. So how do rollbacks work? We already discussed, um, well, this sequence here, how an auto update process would look like. We first push an, push an image, the fleet or the workload pulls it down, it restarts the service with a new image. And well, it could happen that accidentally the sysadmin pushes the wrong image. I am a terrible sysadmin. I'm able to break everything I touch. So I would really love to have something, you know, some security net be below me, which would be able to roll back to the previous known to work image if something bad happens. So this is exactly the fourth step here. We revert to the previous image if the update fails. So once we came up with the idea of implementing that, we were facing the challenge of how could we actually detect if an update fails? Because we, as we already discussed or have seen in the architecture figures before in the illustrations, the main PID of the service is common. And well, system D will mark the, the service as started, at least successfully initially, as soon as Portman sends the ready message via SD notify. So once the container has started, by default, Portman sends the SD sends the ready message to SD notify. So in this case, system D assumes, <coughs> pardon me, that everything's fine, we're cool, the start um, or you know, the service has been started successfully. But if we exit one immediately in the container, this would obviously be wrong. If the container fails after, you know, in um, failed initialization of the database, we would not really get these scenarios. So just by starting the container, system D would assume that it has been started successfully. So in order to really detect if an update has failed, the container workload so what's running inside the container must send the message. And this was uh, a quite interesting journey. We've been working um, quite closely with the community to get that working. So in order to get that work uh, to work, there is dash dash SD notify flag for Portman create and Portman run, which controls the, the SD notify policy. By default, it's, um, I think, Kanban. Um, in this case, we got to set it to container. So when we set it to container, Portman will mount the notify socket 
into the container and Conmon will serve as a proxy. It will just forward the, or mount the socket as well and forward all the, the messages to the host's dbus. So how would a successful update look like when we're um, running a rollback? So in this case, system D receives the ready message an easy way would be just to install systemd notify in the container image. And let's assume we wait for a database to be initialized. This can take a couple of minutes depending on the workload. Once it has been initialized, systemd, you know, we can uh, script it and send systemd notify ready. And well, we get a thumbs up. A failed update, well, either the start timeout kicks in, by default it's 90 seconds, it can be customized either manually in the generated unit files, or also now with popman 4.0, um, we can customize it on the com command line directly. Another scenario where the update would fail is when the main PID dies without sending a ready message. You know, there's really a couple, a couple of things that can go wrong, but using the container notify, SD notify policy, this is a way how rollbacks can be implemented. And this really always depends on the workload, what we're running inside. This is something that the user or the vendor of the, the workload has to specify, but again, Potman makes it uh, really, really easy with Potman Generate System D to make use of that. If you are interested and want to know more about the details, Preeti, Dan, and I wrote a rather detailed article at the end of last year about you know how to use auto updates and rollbacks. We really give an example, step-by-step -step instructions of how to do that, also with a couple of anecdotes and background information of. Uh, you know, all, all the details that I could just scratch on the surface in the past 22 minutes. So as I mentioned before, the team blocks a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, if you're interested uh, in Potman, in uh, the containers ecosystem in, in general, or want to look up the blog post that I mentioned here, either go on the DevConf site, click on the presentation uh, here on the talk, I will upload the slides, or go on potman.io. There you'll find all the informations. There's a blog, we also reference or cross-reference their blogs on other websites. You have uh, information on the mailing list, how to reach out to the team. We have, you know, matrix uh, channel, um, IRC channels, and all the cool, cool stuff that the cool kids use today. We blog a lot on redhat.com, sysadmin, um, on opensource.com, developers, redhat.com. And if you have any questions, if you encounter an issue, if you reach, uh, want to reach out to us or ideally contribute, well, reach out to us on github.com containers slash podman. And that is the end of my presentation. And I'm looking forward to answer any questions. Thank you, Valentin. Thank you for brilliant presentation. I can see a huge interaction in the chat and we have two questions. So quickly on them because we are running out of time. Uh, so the first question is, I had impression that Red Hat wouldn't recommend Podman for production use cases, but rather for development. Is that changing these days with Podman being used as DH uh, and on uh, IOGS, <laughs> if I read it correctly? Uh, IoT is, yeah, Internet of Things. Uh, thank you, Lenka. Um, and thank you also for for the question. Well, I would definitely recommend Potman for production use cases. Um, I mean, uh, Potman is shipped since RHEL 8.0 um, as the only container engine. It has also been shipped before in RHEL 7. Um, yes, definitely use it. And if it doesn't work, please reach out. Um, but, you know, Potman's use case is single node. We are not targeting it to be used in Kubernetes or in OpenShift. Um, this is really single node for developers and also sysadmins or, you know, as I mentioned here in the example, um, when you want to run um, workloads on single nodes. So yes, definitely. Thank you. Great. And another question. Are there ways to avoid downloading full container layers on updates to save uh, bandwidth OS3? 
Um, yes, uh, there is. We are lucky to have an extremely brilliant and talented engineer in our realms, uh, Giuseppe Scribano, um, who is working on that momentarily. Um, he uses uh, new C standard features. So there, it's a rather advanced uh, feature at the moment. The layers must not be in the you know, traditional G SIP compression, but in the C standard compression. And then the, it's possible also with, with Potman to avoid downloading the entire layer, but only what the container needs. So there's uh, plenty of stuff happening at the moment. Giuseppe, um, I, I, I'm not sure if you blocked on that already. If so, please, um, would you share a link in the chat or interact in the chat? Thank you. Thank you, Valentin. So that's uh, that's it. We don't have any other questions, but uh, you are all welcome to join uh, Valentin at the work and work adventure. Uh, so that's it for this session. And now, uh, so thank you for joining. Thanks, Valentin. Uh, and now you are Thanks welcome. For uh, now you are welcome to join the stage room for the break activity. This time it will be a virtual Pictionary with uh, Marie Nordin.